Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to those watching now in Zoom. Welcome to those who will see the later recording and most especially welcome to Eden Royce, the author that we have on today to interview about her latest fantastic middle grade novel, Conjure Island. My name is Kiki. I'm a freelance critic and bookstagrammer at If This Is Paradise. I review all kinds of books, but I have a particular interest in Caribbean literature. I definitely love um, fantasy, speculative, and everything in between. And we're going to have a really great discussion about a book that's quite different from her award-winning debut, but I'm sure that we're all going to equally love. So I'll introduce her for everyone. Eden Royce is a writer from Charleston, South Carolina, now living in Southeast England. She's a Shirley Jackson Award finalist for her short fiction, which has appeared in various print and online magazines. Her debut middle grade novel, Root Magic, is a Walter Award honoree, a Nebula Award finalist, a Mythopoeic Fantasy Award winner, and an Ignite Award winner for outstanding children's literature. We love Ignite. Loved that win for you. Her second middle grade book, Conjure Island, is out now. It's been out since Tuesday, and you're all going to love it. She also loves tea, coffee, bookstores, and roller skating. Not always in that order. <laughs> I'm sure most of us can relate to not necessarily the roller skating for me, but I do like to watch the reels. <laughs> um, so, Eden, how are you? I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. So I'm going to invite you to just give a brief description of Contra Island and then do a short reading so we can get a nice little taste of what it has to offer. Absolutely. Um, one thing I will start out by saying is Contra Island is, at the request of my editor, something that is different from Root Magic, and we wanted it to feel different. So hopefully that comes across. Conjure Island is a contemporary Southern Gothic fantasy set on a fictional island off the coast of South Carolina about a young girl named Dell who has no idea about her Southern roots or her connection to magic. And it isn't until her father is deployed and her grandmother falls ill that she's sent down South to this island to stay with her great grandmother who she never knew before. And she is thrown into a world of magic, monsters, creatures that are hybrids of human and not, and a huge mystery that conceals a part of her own personal history that she has to uncover. Um, one of the reasons I think that the publisher wanted Conjure Island, and I will show you the book. This is the cover. So pretty. I can't wait to get my copy. <laughs> Drawn by the amazing Ashanti Fortson. She is, uh, excuse me, they are a wonderful, wonderful artist. And we wanted something that was very different. And I thought, how can I make this different from Root Magic? And the first thing was make it contemporary instead of historical. Mm -hmm. Take someone who is a kid now with all the technology that's available and put them in a position where there's information that they can't just look up online. And like a lot of African traditional religions, conjure magics, you have to really be careful what, if anything, you can find online. Mm -hmm. When I was going through edits for this book, um, not my main editor for developmental edits, but for copy edits, just that final check. There was a lot of, I can't find a reference for this online. I can't find a reference for this online. And just, you know, lined up in the comments on the side. And I have to make that decision on, do I explain all of it? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I just go, it's correct as is, stet, Amen. and just leave it, leave it be. That's um, it. Because I think there's this assumption that everything we want to know is available online. And especially mm -hmm. for a kid like mm -hmm. Dell, who's only 11, who feels like 
well, it's not important. I'll just look it up online if I need to. And the magical structure of the island prevents that from happening. Not that she would necessarily find those answers anyway. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which I think for a lot of us who have particular cultural and racial backgrounds, like we're used to that. And we can even tell when we look online and see things that like, mm, that's not quite mm. right. So you really can't, you can't really trust online sources when it comes to um, certain kinds of knowledge, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And historically, one of the things for our people, enslaved people historically, has been concealing our knowledge and yep. finding ways of surviving and persevering while making sure that that knowledge is kept safe. And a lot of times that was by concealing it or not sharing all of it completely or twisting mm -hmm. or turning it in a way that is going to be unrecognizable to someone that doesn't already know. Right, yeah, yeah, love that. Okay, so you can do the reading now, if you like, yeah. Yeah, I won't start at the beginning like I did with Root Magic. I think I might mm -hmm. start uh, within chapter five. Cool. Um, because I think this is one of my, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. It's um, the meeting of Dell and seeing her grandmother, great grandmother, excuse uh, me, yeah. for the first time. So the okay. very beginning of the book is Dell is moving yet again. She's a military kid. She's used to this. She's used to being the new kid at school, even though she doesn't like it. And because of that, she has a lot of barriers up and she feels that her father and her grandmother, those are the people that she needs and wants in her life. Everybody else is on the periphery and is unimportant. Um, then when this happens, her father's away on a military uh, expedition, can't get back. Her grandmother falls ill. And because she's this ultra capable kid, she thinks I can stay by myself. Well, in reality, it no, you can't, Dal. <laughs> you can't. You're 11. Yeah. So, <laughs> so here's what's going to happen you're going to go and stay with your great grandmother in South Carolina. I didn't even know about her. Who is she? Why didn't I know about her before? So, this is where she starts to realize the situation that she's in. Mm -hmm. Dell hummed the melody to her grandma's song as she waited. How could she stand a few weeks of this? Already, she didn't want to spend another day in this place. In front of her was calm gray-green water. It ran as far as she could see, broken only by an occasional splash from a fish leaping up, then plunging beneath the surface. The fish's movement captured the attention of a passing bird, and it dove like an arrow into the ocean, then swooped up, rising into the sky with its wriggling catch and flying off until Dell couldn't see it anymore. Dell leaned down to pick up a smooth, flat stone and flung it into the water with all of her might. It landed with a thunk and a splash. Then ripples floated outward from where it sank into the ocean. Satisfied, she brushed the sand off her hands, confident she'd show her dad when she could be of help, and he'd apologize for sending her down here, and he'd... The whirling rush of Dell's thoughts came to an abrupt stop as a boat appeared on the water, gliding toward the shore. Dell leaped to her feet, the suitcase toppling behind her. That boat hadn't been there a second ago. Nothing except birds and fish were in that water. Where had it come from? Dell blinked, bringing the boat into focus under the almost blinding sunlight. It was a wooden boat and didn't appear to have any sort of outboard motor. Still, it moved smoothly across the water. A figure stood in the middle of the small craft, but there were no paddles or oars and Dell wondered how it was moving at all. Her shoulders tensed. As the boat grew closer, she could see the person in the boat was an old woman, 
She stood tall and still as a statue, with her arms crossed in front of her. The boat rocked gently from side to side, but the woman didn't lose her balance. Del had been so busy with packing, the plane ride, the car trip. She hadn't really thought much about the fact that for the first time in her life, she would be meeting a member of her family that wasn't dad or grandma. But looking this woman in the eyes, reality dropped inside her like the stone she had carelessly thrown in the ocean. The woman wore a long sleeved pale blue and white striped dress made from some floaty fabric. Even with the long sleeves of the dress, not a drop of sweat showed on the woman's face. In one hand, she held a walking stick of shiny polished wood, almost as tall as she was, that gleamed in the sunlight. Bright red cloth covered the place where the woman's hand rested. A sense of power and strength emanated from her, and for the briefest moment, Del caught a fleeting scent of cinnamon. Del could see something familiar in the face of the woman floating toward her. The woman's hair was dark and coily like Dell's, but swept up in a high bun with a silvery gray streak in the front. They were a similar brown complexion. There was something in her expression Dell recognized, though she couldn't put her finger on it. She shook her head, remembering her dad's instructions. Be polite, be polite, be polite. The boat approached the shore where Dell expected it to come to a gradual stop, but it didn't. Instead, it lifted up from the ocean, water dripping from the bottom like a rubber duck plucked out of a bathtub. Dell's mouth fell open. The biggest alligator she'd ever seen climbed up onto the shore, the boat on its back. It waddled up on the sand through scrubby grasses and crouched, waiting. The alligator had to be longer than the bus Del used to ride to school. She hoped it wasn't hungry. As if in response, the alligator opened its massive jaws wide. It snapped its teeth and swished its tail impatiently, but it didn't come any closer. Del yanked her gaze away from the creature and found the woman looking her over from head to toe. Her eyes went from Del's waterfall of plaits that hung almost to her waist, down to her yellow braids rule ringer t-shirt, then her jeans, and finally her white sneakers with the braided shoelaces. The corners of the woman's mouth twitched up and then she spoke. Her voice was smooth, the words crisp and tart as a green apple. You must be Delphinia. How do? Um, hi? She winced at the use of her full name. She hated it so much. None of the kids at school, she, none of the kids at any school she'd been to could even pronounce it right. I like Del. Who is, oh, I see. The old woman nodded as if making a note to herself. You prefer to be called Del. The woman held her shoulders back and her head high as she stepped backward in the boat. She was graceful as a queen and her movements were like dance steps. My name is Rose Vesey. I'm your grandmother's mother. Even though Dell knew the woman was her relative, hearing it was still a shock. You're my Nana Rose. Nana Rose, her great grandmother repeated slowly, like she was testing out the title. I like that. She patted the side of the wooden boat so it let out a hollow thump, then held out her hand. Come on aboard. Is it? Del eyed the reptile's massive jaw. The beast could probably snap her up in one mouthful. Is it safe? Nana Rose raised her eyebrows. Why wouldn't it be? Del blinked at her, then set her jaw and crept forward. Carefully, she placed her suitcase in the boat. The alligator stayed still for the most part, but one of its eyes rolled to follow her movements. That's old Lundy, a legend around these parts. He won't bother you a bit. Nana Rose sat down and patted the alligator's massive tail. He let out a growl sigh. 
unless you bother me, that is. Del gulped. She'd seen a documentary once that said a young alligator could knock over a full-grown adult with a single swipe of its tail. She could only imagine what a gator like Lundy could do to a kid. Yeah, uh, don't worry, I won't. She took Nana Rosa's hand and with surprising strength, the woman tugged her aboard. Now that's settled. Let's go. As they glided up through the water, Del snuck glances at the woman beside her. You don't look like a grandmother, Del said. You don't look like a great grandmother, Del said. And what does a great grandmother look like? She hesitated. Well, you know. No, I don't know. That's why I asked. Nana Rose trailed her fingertips in the water. It's important to ask when you don't know the answer to something. No, I don't know. That's why I asked. The same words Del heard her grandmother use just a few days ago. It was disturbing, like hearing an echo after too much time had passed. Del looked closer at Nana Rose, trying to think of a response to her question. Just old, I guess. Well, I am that. You're not angry or offended? Nana Rose laughed. That you said I was old? It's true, isn't it? Del looked away from her warm gaze. I guess. You said the words. Better own them. The boat glided through the water, only rocking slightly. Del wanted to brush her fingertips over the part of old Lundy's wide, greenish brown back that the boat didn't cover but the thought of that huge, powerful jaw filled with craggy teeth made her pause. She decided to change the subject. My dad said you're a teacher. What do you teach? The school specializes in teaching our people's history. Our people? Nana Rose nodded. Yes, Sea Island people, Gullah people, like me and your grandmother and your mother, who are directly descended from enslaved Africans who built the rice cotton and indigo industries in this country. Many of our ways echo those in West and West Central Africa. Has Violet, your grandmother, told you anything about our family or this island? Del turned in the boat to look back at the shore. They drifted forward so easily that if she hadn't looked behind her, she would have thought they weren't moving at all. The land they had departed from was so far in the distance now, she could barely see it. It felt as far away as her life with grandma and dad. I think I'll stop there. I don't know if that was five minutes or not. Oh, I wasn't even timing. I was too into it, so it's fine. <laughs> so I was happy to keep listening. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, that's, a, that's a memorable scene for me too especially because old Lundy is one of my favorite characters and I can't even explain why, but I just love him very much. Even though I think I too would be very afraid of him. Should I ever come across his path? <laughs> Treat him with a great deal of respect. Uh, yes, but... a great deal of respect <laughs> from a distance. <laughs> from, from a distance, but like, you know, we can hang out a little. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, so I'll get right away into the questions. That's actually a great passage for um in terms of the direction I plan to take the conversation. But I wanted to start out with the idea of how different it is from Root Magic. Because in listening to um, the interview with you did with Tales from the podcast, which is a fabulous one, you guys should check it out if you have a chance to. Um, you did mention how it was sort of like an industry advice to make your second book as different from the first book as you could. And I thought you did that very well, but I did want to know what was behind you moving in the specific direction of a kind of portal fantasy, also with a, a magic school, um, which is quite popular, but I promise you, you have not read a magic school quite like the one in this book. But yeah, I'd love to know what sort of made you go into that specific direction. Well, at the time, um, the idea that I had for the story was I wanted to make it educational, but that sort of fun educational that you can get swept up in the story without mm -hmm. it feeling like a lesson that right. you're going to school to learn. So I thought, 
how can I portray conjure in a way that doesn't sound either preachy or too much like I'm giving a lecture. Mm -hmm. And I thought, not only can I make this different from Root Magic with it being a contemporary book, but also I want to make the main character someone who isn't Southern, someone who doesn't have any idea about magic, who hasn't sort of grown up in the culture and was just waiting for her chance to learn. Mm -hmm. This is someone who's coming into a situation who is not even a disbeliever, but someone who has no idea that any of this existed. Mm -hmm. And when I chatted with my editor about it, he was the one that even mentioned the term portal fantasy Ooh, to me. Okay. Yeah. Because I wasn't familiar with the term. And he says, well, it sounds like what you're wanting to do is a portal fantasy. Mm -hmm. And he said, they can be really challenging. And at one point I went, oh, no, oh. I'm out. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't scare me like that. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. I, I don't mean for it to be like that. It's just, you're going to have to set up the world outside of the fantasy world, the normal world, if you want to use that term. Then you're going to have to set up what this portal is that the character goes through and then you'll do your world building for your fantasy world so it's not like it's necessarily hard it's just more steps and more work and when i read sarah makiba days's essay be here now the south is a portal i thought okay maybe i am supposed to write this as a portal fantasy maybe i am supposed to do three times the work and <laughs> figure out the structure for this book. Yeah. So um, her article, her essay, excuse me, is absolutely wonderful. And if you get a chance to read it. Oh, I've read it. Is, oh, you yeah. have? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it saved on my on my laptop, yeah. It is phenomenal. She is an incredible uh, historian and just all around amazing uh, cultural reservoir of knowledge. Um, but for anybody who hasn't read it, it is in Root Work Journal. Um, the title of the essay is Be Here Now, colon, The South is a Portal. Uh, and it's by Sarah Makiba Days, D-A-I-S-E. And I read that and I thought, um, and I've talked with her, with Sarah, several times. She has written the... Um, intro to the educational guide for Root Magic and the educational guide for Conjure Island. Uh, she has also narrated one of my stories, which is partially written in Gullah, um, which is in my new collection, um, Who Lost I Found. So we met that way. And the way that I met Sarah, she and I sort of consider it that. So it was just, I don't know, maybe you can call it kismet that we even came across each other um, because I was wondering and wanting more connections and it just happened in a way that just sort of was like a portal, just opened up and I met her and several other people who were creatives, um, who were of a similar background to me and I said, well, let's Let's get the story recorded. So she did the voice, Mar Marlanda DeKine, who is an amazing Gullah Geechee poet, did the audio and the fine tuning of it. And it was just a phenomenal experience. And we've stayed in touch over the years since that story's come out. Um, so I asked Sarah, I said, can I use that phrase, the South as a portal is one of the epigraphs at the beginning of the book because it really is how Dell's story moves and how it comes into being. It's very much her realizing that her life is connected to this place that she's never been, that she's never heard of, but because of who she is and who her mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, who all of those people are, she has this innate connection 
to a place and therefore to a time in history that will be able to pull her in and take her further than she thought that she could go without that knowledge, information, and connections. So it just sort of all fit into place with, ooh, you're doing a portal fantasy, and you've got this amazing quote, you've got this girl who doesn't really know her ancestry, who doesn't really want to be here. And I thought of my cousins who were from up north, who got sent down south every year in the summer to visit. And I was the youngest of the cousins. So uh, it was my pretty much first time and only time during the year where I was more knowledgeable about things than they were. You know, so my being the youngest was sort of thrown by the wayside for those weeks during the summer where I knew where things are. I knew how the house operated. I knew who people were that stopped by. I knew how to cook and prepare things. So I knew the routine of the house where they were the ones who were on the back foot for the first time. So all of that, I think I put sort of in that cauldron and stirred together and pulled out Conjure Island. That's insightful. So I've shared the, the link to the essay and um, the Zoom and for those watching later on YouTube, but I'm included in the information box at the bottom. You'll be able to access it. And Sarah's website as well. She has a podcast as well. Like she's quite, she's got a, she's got a lot of work that you can explore at, at your leisure in concert with books um and for the the magic school aspect as well um i found it to be one of the most powerful elements of the story for me because um, the magic school has become so popularized especially in titles like harry potter and uh i remember watching the movie when i was younger not having read the book and being really shocked at how much for a little black girl in Jamaica who had attended a boarding school that was founded late 19th century. In watching this film and the setting, which I believe part of it was filmed, especially the big dining room at Oxford University at Christchurch College, I actually recognized it. Like obviously we didn't have huge ancient stone structures, but I recognized the design of the dining room, which was exactly what it was at my boarding school. The exact same arrangement with the benches at the bottom with the head table where the teachers and the principal is with the principal in the middle with like the photos of the school founders around um, the house system and how it worked in concert with punishment and reward like all of it what I was like that's my school um but I was like in the 21st century and this was clearly like some in Jamaica and here was this very British, and what I then realized very colonial setup in England, and my entire school life in a way, in some fashion, had been crafted exactly in its image. And it was very disturbing after a while, actually, um, to know that even a century on, it, they had like such a hold on so much of what was considered to be the best schooling, because a lot of the best schools in Jamaica are considered to fit their traditional, and by traditional, they tend to mean um, what fits that lineage. And even if it's newer, they're associated with, for example, um, Christian denominations that have that kind of, like Roman Catholics that have that kind of um, centuries long lineage. And, and, I, and I thought, oh, and I noticed this being repeated in various magic school fantasies. And I find that even the ones um, by black authors, brown authors, you know, non-white authors in general, where they try to, they flip it and it's folks like us who are in the schools. Um, I find there's still this elitist element that's, um, that's there. It's, it's sort of sequestered away and you're super special if you're the one who's been chosen to me and it makes you like a special in a kind of category above the rest, maybe it's aligned to royalty, maybe, but you know, like there are still these elements and I was reading Conjure Island, sort of, I think 
expecting it to be the same thing, but it's not at all, actually. Um, I, I And I want to know, I mean, did that come out naturally just in the writing because of who you're writing about and the community that you're pulling from, but it just kind of turned out that way? Or if this was something you went in intentionally, because just to let those of you know who haven't read it, um, it's just not built on that elitist structure at all. Like it's very much grounded in a cultural communal, like it's so different. So if you could talk about that a little bit, yeah. Absolutely. I will disclose up front, I have never read a Harry Potter book. Amen. I have never seen like, any of the movies. That's fine. So I have to, I have to disclose that. And yes. uh, my agent was saying at the time where I spoke about my ideas for Conjure Island, she said, well, if you're writing about a magic school in any way, shape, or form, you're going to get, your book is going to be compared to that book. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, uh, there's not much you can do about that once the book is out in the world. People have different references for things and will come to your book having had different experiences. So I thought, well, that's fine. But what I wanted to do with Conjure Island was build it from the community level up. And I wanted it to be. It's a summer school. It's a few weeks in the summer, um, and the teachers, uh, sorcels, are very upfront about this is a, a primer. This is a little bit of knowledge that you're going to be exposed to about a vast topic that people spend their lives learning. But we're going to give you these little bits of information so that you can decide if this is what you want to do. Because they tell you that it will require study. It will require time. And there isn't a magical person who's just perfect at it without doing any work. Because I wanted that to be the basis of conjure magic in general, it's the basis of a lot of African traditional religions that you have to put the work in. It's not just going to magically appear. This is care, this is study, this is intention, this is focus. This is being in community with people who already know more than you, not that they know everything, but this is putting yourself in a place to be open to things and to learn. So there isn't a, and I don't think this is a spoiler to say there isn't a big bad magic antagonist out there that is pummeling people that you're going to have to come together and fight, you know, with the very brief magic that you've been exposed to. It's not that kind of magic school. And I think that some of the magic school books that I have heard people discussing, there is always this fight that has to happen. There's always this battle. There's always some kind of um, violent interaction between groups of people. And that isn't what conjure magic is about in general. And it is a magic that is supposed to bring people together. It's healing, it's protecting, it's showing a way to preserve yourself and your culture. So I wanted to focus on that. And I also wanted to focus on, which is something that my editor mentioned to me while I was going through edits. He said, you know, one thing that I love about what you've done in this book is that I don't see in other magic school books is you talk about why. You talk about why things are done, why the magic works this way. What is the origin of the magic and why does doing this work in the way that it does? And he said in a lot of magic school books he worked on, you don't get that. You don't get the history and the background and all of that. You get your magical implement here or your 
spell casting words or your whatever the thing is that allows you to do the magic. If you have the thing, you can do the magic. And that's not what Conjure is about in general. And I didn't think that that was the thing to bring to a book when the magic itself is so very different. So I wanted to build in the fact that it's going to take time. You're not going to be perfect at it. Nobody expects you to be perfect at it. People expect you to want to be here. People expect you to want to learn, to try, to be open-minded. And when it comes, it comes. And I wanted to give readers that experience of this is how magic has worked in a lot of African traditional religions over the years and centuries. And it's sort of where the school motto came from as well. Be protect, educate, survive. That came to me fairly early on in the writing because um, I knew that was going to be the school's motto. Yeah. Yeah, that's it was it was it was perfect. Like everything that you just said, I think was ably conveyed. Um, and I'm gonna go into that direction next because I thought that was also again just all tied to the way it was really about community. And I don't think this is a spoiler either, but like if you're not some kind of fantastic magic user, like they're not gonna kick you out. Like, it's not a matter of like, here's a test and oops, you don't have, I don't know, the level, like you're not hitting that spot on the thermometer or whatever, like they're not going to throw you out. Like you are still 100% full-fledged member of the school. Like it's just so different and it's so warm. And I think for those of us who read Root Magic and just thought like that book was such a warm embrace and just made you feel welcome, like Tundra Island is exactly the same you're it's the, as I said in stories the book will take care of you like those are the kind of books Eden Royce writes like the book is gonna take care of you so I want to move in further into that direction in terms of the sort of um African attentive culture that's in the book because as a and that ties with the Caribbean because um in that passage that you read when Nana Rose tells her about like um the, the source of, of their culture and linking it back to West Africa, this automatically opens up who they are to like a, a broader section of the diaspora. And I remember you again, bringing up in that podcast interview about the publisher thinking it was like a regional book. And when you said regional, I genuinely thought, oh, I guess she means North America. And then you said the South and I was like, what? But regardless, the point being, as Caribbean readers, and you've said it, my friend and Diana said it, um, my Jamaican friend in Britain said it, reading this book, it feels Caribbean. Um, another author, a Haitian Canadian American author, actually, Miriam J. Sean C., she got Root Magic and she had it in her Read Caribbean staff, which for those who don't know, Read Caribbean is a hashtag on Instagram where you post about Caribbean literature. That's what you use the hashtag Read Caribbean. And she had it in the stack. And she said uh, her, in, her, in the caption was, this isn't technically a Caribbean book, but it feels Caribbean. And she had like Gullah Geechee Nation in brackets. And I was like, I 100% agree with the inclusion of the book. No complaints from me. So I really want to explore that as this is something that I first noticed in Root Magic. So it starts with that proverb at the beginning. And I know I have Jamaicans in the chat right now. So when you read it and you get to that epigraph, the first proverb you see, the first one is new broom sweep clean, but old ones get the corners. And, it's, and she has it detailed as a Gullah Geechee proverb. Now, when I read it, I was disoriented. I was like, a Gullah Geechee proverb? I was like, it's a Jamaican proverb. I was like, did I, did I, did I misremember? I was like, did I, did we get it from somewhere? Like I was or disoriented for a few seconds and it, it kind of clicked like, do we actually have the same thing? So I immediately went into stories and I was like, Caribbean people, here is this proverb, Jamaican, like, do you have something like this? Because Jamaicans, I know we have something similar. And my Jamaican friend said, 
that's pretty much how we say it except maybe in Pasa, I guess but like that phrasing is exactly it the Bahamians had something a little different but it was close to the same um I had it written down so I'll have to send it over to you because I have it saved so we have like the Gullah Geechee proverb, the new brooms to the corner. And then with the brooms in particular, which really blew my mind. So in Dominica, we have someone in the chat saying, learn the exact same proverb in Dominica. Like I'm telling you, <laughs> it's the exact same thing. And then with the broom, uh, as a Jamaican with Rastafari and with the Baba Shanti house in particular, they have really strong connections to the broom. So in this book, folks, you're used to brooms being associated with magic and witchcraft. But in this book, it is unlike any other one I think you've read. I'm going to put it out there. Maybe you even won't say it, but I'm going to put it out there. It's, com it's just completely different. And maybe I won't give too many details on it. I'll leave it to her to say, but it's a completely different framing. And the relationship they have with the broom actually reminded me of Bobo Shanti relationship with the broom and how in Kingston, my family always bought our brooms from them and I've just haven't changed. So the last time my broom wore down, I waited a long time. It was pandemic, they weren't around until I finally saw one. They, usually we call them broomy because that's a call that they shout out when they're walking around with the brooms on their shoulders. Um, I think in another space you mentioned Olandi also had a, a Caribbean connection, which I am not that familiar with, but I'd love you to get into it. So could you talk about it? I mean, is it something again that you were more intentional about with this book or just kind of naturally came up? Because I'm listing some things, but there's more for you to know. And I think depending on where you are in the Caribbean, I'm thinking especially of Trinidad and Tobago with the Orisha um, spirituality being stronger there. I feel like there are a lot of things they might notice as well. It just depends on where you are. So yeah, just talk about it because it's really fabulous. It gets me so excited. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I love putting in notes of my culture. And I didn't know at the time that that particular phrase, proverb, was throughout the Caribbean at the time. But I have had since several people mention um, mm. and I didn't, I didn't write it in Gullah Geechee in the epigraph. I usually save that for further on in the book, if I'm going to use it. Um, right. and I'm really sort of circumspect with how I use it. Um, because throughout some of the processes of publishing, there's a lot of requests to explain certain things and detail certain things. And I usually hesitate to do that for a number of reasons. And I realized that part of that is because it's a book for children and they want a little bit more explanation. But with that particular phrase, which is something that my grandmother always used to say, um, especially if, you know, I was one of those kids that I couldn't keep a hobby. You know, I would start on something, um, I would abandon it. I would use it, do it for a little while. And if I wasn't great at it immediately, I would abandon it and go on to something else or whatever. And that was sort of, you know, how my grandmother would, you know, refer to it. She just would consider it a new broom. A new broom is sweet clean, but all one gets to the corner. And it was one of those things that has always stuck with me. And when I started writing this book, I thought about a lot of the connections specifically um, between the Bahamas, um, Gullah Geechee people, um, a lot of the people who were slave owners in the Bahamas mm -hmm. um, and Barbados especially moved a lot of the enslaved people directly from those particular islands to South Carolina, Georgia, parts of um, North Carolina. And a lot of those specific people who were from those islands came directly to the Carolinas, which is why Gullah Geechee sounds 
so much like um, the Creole that's spoken in Barbados mm -hmm. because there is that direct link. Years ago, I worked with um, a woman who was from Barbados and we would ride the Metro. And I mentioned, I don't even remember what the phrase was that I told her my grandmother said, and she laughed and she said, your grandmother sounds like my grandmother. <laughs> and we had these conversations about our families and practices. And there is documented evidence between Barbados and uh, Gullah Geechee Corridor with people um, coming directly from that island to, um, for a various number of reasons, to set up um, and keep people, enslaved people, isolated, thus preserving the Gullah language, which is why it sounds so similar, which is why a lot of the um, Hoodoo Obeya is very similar, which is why a lot of the proverbs have survived. Um, a lot of the interactions with broom use and walking sticks as being part of um, knowledge and elders um, and having it being a grounding force, which is why Nana Rose um, carries her walking stick all the time. Um, I won't let, you know, um, flip one of the spoilers in the book. Right. But when it gets to the brooms, um, brooms are such a deep part of the culture and they are treated with respect. They are treated as companions. They're not the same brooms that are used for cleaning. These are completely different brooms that are used for spell casting or for connection to the earth. And one of the things that um, I wanted to make sure of that I got into this book is and we do not ride them. We have conjured, do not ride brooms. It is not a thing in this particular magical culture. Maybe that's something that's done in other magic schools. And this is what one of the sources tells Dell because she's very dismissive of this initially. And she's like, Ugh, brooms, what are we gonna do? Just like ride around on them? And the room goes silent. And everybody's like, oh, poor Dell. Like, oh, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> and so she learned very quickly, she's like, we, no, this is not what you may have experienced before. We do not ride brooms. This is not a thing. Um, one of the girls, and there's ways that brooms are used throughout the book. Um, there is a move to a new house where there is a cleaning ritual that goes on when they first move to the house. Yes. Um, Ava, who... And I don't know if this is something done across the Caribbean or not, but she's recently had her ears pierced. And instead of gold studs in her ear, she has tiny pieces of broom straw in her ears instead of. Uh, ah, I haven't seen broom ears. straw necessarily, but I've definitely seen some kind of um, plant matter being used. I'm remembering from my childhood actually. So if anyone has details, um you can add it in the chat but i've definitely i remember seeing that growing up they wouldn't have the earrings they would have like a piece of like green plant looking thing like do their ears instead mm -hmm. yeah yeah i didn't think about that oh yeah hmm. and she she does twist them periodically during the book mm -hmm. so you know it's a new it's a new piercing but it's a little piece of broom straw that's sort of been you know uh burned on one end to keep it in play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Rochelle says she used grass stalks in hers when she, hers just got pierced. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely remember seeing that. Um, and Holandi, I'd love for you to talk about oh, that. Yeah. I, I, that was when I was less familiar with, yeah. Um, there is a, I hesitate to use the word creature, but it's the best term I can use. Um, called Uncle Monday, who mm -hmm. does, you know, take the form of um, a, an alligator. And I wanted this, I wanted the gator in Conjure Island to be, I wanted him to be intimidating or at least to look intimidating. And for, sure. for there to be this initial fear 
of him. But as the book goes along, she learns that Old Lundy is a good resource of knowledge, especially about the mystery she's trying to peel away. So instead of calling him Uncle Monday, I went with Lundy, which is the French word for Monday. Monday I wanted yeah. to, it's my way of trying to sort of conceal certain things, but mm -hmm. if you're aware of certain things, you just sort of you you just know. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, yeah. And I love doing that, and I love coming across that in uh, other people's writings. Like, um, there's a book called Tropic Death by Eric Walrund, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, that particular book, I but he not. was a Bajan writer. Ooh. And when I read that, and it's a very short volume, when I read those short stories, I see the connection between the language used in his book, which I think was written in maybe 1920, mm -hmm. um, and the Gullah language that I grew up with, a lot of the words are very similar. Uh, a lot of the abbreviations, uh, the word bakra for white person, yeah, a lot yeah, of the yeah. terminology is, is the same from Eric Walron's book. And I read yeah. that book and it is just, the cadence of the words and the language is so familiar to me. Um, I yeah. absolutely uh, adore that collection. Yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. Bakra is definitely something that's um, popularly used still. I mean, I think even um, Small Island by Andrea Levy, um, and she was a first gen Jamaican British writer and about the Windrush and they had mm -hmm. characters in there calling the landlady a, <laughs> like she moved like a back row. <laughs> so. I, think, I think Nalo, Nalo Hopkinson mm -hmm. folk might also use that word, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's definitely pretty um, still used, I would say. Maybe not the most popular world, but it's still known for sure, for sure. Mm. Um, so I'm going to move a little more into the, the characters now um and their emotional storyline that they have so another similarity i'd say or a consistent sort of thematic element that i noticed coming over from root magic is the theme of is of death and grief and loss and i wanted to know um yeah what like what's that about eden i have a friend who really appreciates you putting that <laughs> who really appreciates you putting that actually in middle grade books. She's a pediatrician. And she says mm -hmm. that um, kids really need more books that address these topics. Like sometimes it's things, especially that their families aren't talking about, or people tend to think that they don't need to know about these things. But actually, obviously from her perspective as a pediatrician um, and dealing with families, she's like, this is absolutely something um, that they go through like anyone else and she really mm -hmm. loves to see it in books. So um, yeah, could you talk about that a little bit and how it um, affects the family members? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I didn't honestly realize that uh, <laughs> death and funerals and grief were such a uh, huge theme in my work until I was looking for a specific document and I couldn't remember what I named it. So I said, okay, I know I talk about a funeral in it. Let me just search for the word funeral. Well, I'll find it. <laughs> so many documents came up and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Then. Need something a little more to, specific. Yeah, I had to figure out something more specific to find the document I was looking for. But that was sort of how I, it just struck me that this was something I write about a great deal. But I do agree with your friend uh, who's a pediatrician that there's this hesitancy sometimes in middle grade books, books for kids, mm -hmm. thinking that kids can't grasp big topics, that they can't understand grief, that they can't understand loss. And I like writing about it because it is it's something that isn't always dealt with in a, I'm not going to talk down to you kind of way. If it is mentioned, it's almost, um, 
I think sometimes it does talk down to kids a little bit too much when it's mentioned, but I like writing about it so that if an adult who's responsible for a kid is trying to find a way to talk about grief, who's trying to find a way to talk about the loss of someone important in the family, that they have resources and jumping off points because it can be difficult to bring the subject up and it's hard to do. And I think especially when you as the adult are also grieving, it's very hard to manage your own pain and hurt and loss as well as be there for a kid and try to uplift them, explain things, be there for questions when your own heart is broken. So I like being able to have these stories that wrap up either an adventure or a mystery or something else around the grief so that kids have an understanding of, yes, this is really tough right now, but eventually I will be able to step forward, not saying that everything is going to be the same as it was. It's always going to be different. But I do have within me the ability to go on, whether that's learning about my background, facing the fact that my family is now different, being able to realize that I have ancestors to call on. My loved one eventually will be one of those ancestors that I can talk to or know who's there looking out for me. So I think it's important to have those things for kids because it's hard to just start topics yeah. and start talking about death and loss as a topic. Yeah. So this is something that you can read with your kids, give your kids to read, depending on the age of the kid, and have a conversation of, what did you think about this? Did you feel the same way that Dell or Jez or Jay did? Do you want to talk about it? Did it help seeing them move forward through their pain in order to do things and in order to realize that there's still a lot of life left, there's still a lot to do and still a way to move forward with those memories and knowledge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I have to say, this is a good message for adults as well. Um, <laughs> not just for the kids, because um, I mean, I still remember reading Root Magic um, after my cousin passed and it was during the pandemic. And so when I hit the funeral scene, we weren't able to have that kind of funeral for her. And reading it in Root Magic really, it like really mixed feelings, but it, it hit me harder than I expected. And I, I love that it started out that way because I didn't know that I needed it until I read it in, in Root Magic. So um, I really appreciate you um, writing these themes into your work. Um, for sure. And to kind of wrap up to my last question, so if you have any questions, guys, let me know. Um, is it a question? Is that, well, yeah, it's a question and a comment, I guess. Um, I find that your books, and there's another writer, H.D. Hunter, who's from Atlanta, and I don't know what it is about you Southern writers that I just connect with so much with your work. There's just something about Black Southern U.S. writers, but um, you both balance so well um, addressing both kids and adults in your books in a way that feel that doesn't marginalize either. It's not, I don't think at all similar to the kind of conversation that happens in the young adult space where there's concern that books are being too aimed at adults is not, not, a much, not enough for the teens or whatever. Um, I don't find that um, with the middle grade I read and not with yours and the HD Hunters in, in particular. And it, it feels as if um, a lot of this story is also for the adults, like there's a conversation happening with the adults and there's a conversation happening with the kids in concert 
but you you definitely feel involved in a particular way, not just in a, oh, I remember feeling like this as a child. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, um, I feel like that has to be intentional. Like, could you talk um, a bit about um, why you have that approach to your writing, your middle grade? Yeah. And it, it could be a, a Black Southern writer thing, um, but I feel like at least, I can't speak for HD, but at least for me, um, growing up, I spent a lot of time around adults. I was an only child. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time in the house where adults were talking, people were coming by the house for visits, and I would listen to a lot of these stories. And I think that kids understand and can grasp a lot more than sometimes adults believe that they can. But then on the other side of that, a lot of times, especially Black Southerners, we have to educate our kids about certain really difficult topics at a very young age because it's a safety measure. So we have to find a way to talk to our kids about difficult topics um, as specifically Black American Southerners, how to be safe, who to trust, what to do when you're not with a family member or an adult. I think that one of the other things from the other side of writing for adults as well, because I started out my career writing for adults. Right, yeah. I'm realizing that from people who have talked to me about root magic and things that are in root magic that adults have come to me and said, I got this book for my kids, but what I got from root magic surprised me. I was surprised that I needed the words that were in this book. Mm -hmm. And I realized that a lot of us growing up for whatever reason, didn't have someone to tell us a lot of the things that Root Magic tells us. We didn't grow up with adults in our lives that may have fought the things that happened in Root Magic, but they weren't ever or always verbally communicated to us in a way that this is something, these are words that will strengthen you when times get hard. This is what you need to hear. This is something that you can hold on to in your heart when you go out there in the big wide world and have people say all kind of thing to you. These are those nuggets that are in root magic that I think adults have realized. I didn't get this as a kid because I think some of us grow up with parents who are super busy. They're trying to keep the family going. They're trying to put food on the table, they're working, they're trying to manage themselves. And a lot of times we didn't maybe get all of that direction that we may have needed. So for any of those adults who as a kid didn't get that, this person who's so important in your life may not be here physically anymore, but you have an eternal connection to them. They're always gonna be a part of you. Those stories, those songs, those recipes, those hugs, all those words of affirmation and encouragement, those are still there. Those are still available to you. And finding a way to move forward through difficult times is something that all of us as an adult need a reminder of. Mm -hmm. Because it's very, very easy to feel alone in the world. Like I'm the only person that's enduring this or that's going through that or whatever have you. I think by nature, sometimes society is isolating to make you feel like I'm the only one going through this. So what do I do? So it makes you want to turn to, you know, worldly means of dealing with those situations. When you have other means of dealing with it, mm -hmm. you have other means of talking things out, going to people that you share community with, ancestral veneration, whatever those, you know, who do rituals and rites are, all of those things are available to you. And that's what Jess and Jay learn in Root Magic. And that's something that I think a lot of adults didn't have 
And that's why it resonates so much with adults because they're getting told those same things that they may not have heard when they were 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I still remember the scene in Root Magic with the mother when she's grieving, you know, her husband who has just disappeared and she changed the crop in the field completely and she just replants it for, I still remember that scene. I still think about that sometimes, like, we love Clunder Island, but if you haven't read Root Magic, you're wasting time. Like, get that book right now. I'm not even joking. Um, so we have one question from Rochelle. You can take a look at it in the chat if you like, Eden, but I'll read it out okay. for the purposes of the recording. So Rochelle says, I loved the extended family dynamics in Root Magic, and the extended family also seems to feature in Conjur Island. Is this simply a reflection of Gullah Geechee family units, or is that a deliberate decision on your part to highlight the importance of extended family? Thank you so much I for the question. Yes, thank you, Rochelle, so much for this question. To be honest, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, my family, as far as growing up in the house, I had a very small family. There were three people in our family, very similar to Dell. But my grandmother was sort of that, not just the matriarch of our household, but sort of of the community and of the area. She was that person that people came to for advice. Yeah. So there was always somebody in the house, whether it was extended family or neighbors or whatever. Um, and so they became sort of that what we call play family, play aunts and uncles and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we had other family members who had moved away, who would come back to the house in Charleston over the summers or for holidays and interacting with people that you haven't seen for months at a time or for a year and realizing these are still your people and you still have this connection and you just fall into that routine of chatting and talking and sharing like they'd never left almost like a friend you haven't seen in a long time who both of you are busy but when you finally do get together it's like no time has passed um i was asked to write an essay about food for a publication i haven't written it yet um, so maybe this conversation will help me decide what to do, but, um, I thought about writing Gullah Geechee communal food as a topic that I think ties in with Rochelle's question, um, extended family to not mean just blood family, but people that live next door, people that live on your street people who you see every day when you walk out of your door, that you hail, you know, when you're on your way to work or school or whatever. And those people end up being an extended family in a community. And I grew up in an area where if somebody went fishing and they had a huge catch, they'd come knocking on the door, you know, saying that, you know, they had some fish to share or they went shrimping and they would knock on the door and everybody on the street got a little portion of it. So nobody went hungry, nobody went without. It was just that sort of known thing in the community that if you had a big harvest of something, my grandmother was sending me with a bag of pecans to take around to different people. Um, people would come by with crabs or shrimp or whatever. I just bring you this, Miss Helen, just because I had catch this for you. You know, that sort of thing of communal eating and communal sharing and making sure that if you had, everybody had. So it was that sort of extended family and taking care of people who are not just blood relatives and family, but people who shared community and shared space with you. Does that answer your question at all, Rochelle? I think I um, probably babbled a little bit. <laughs> 
No, she says, oh, she, she loved it. Yes. So oh, good. I can start talking on a topic and I just will go. Get going. You're in the, the right, yeah. you're in the right space for it. You're in the right space for it. Um, but, but it is um, after two, we've hit over the hour. So I'm going to be wrapping up now. Um, and so my final question for you will be like some, what are like upcoming projects? Do you have any more uh, middle grade titles in store? I know you write for adults as well. So anything that you want to talk up before we go, you're quite welcome to. Absolutely. Um, because we are on the subject of grief and death and loss, um, my mm -hmm. next middle grade, which is coming out next year, um, is a Southern Gothic horror haunted house story. Um, called The Creepening of Dogwood House, um, about the hoodoo tradition of hair burning. Uh, that's coming out next year. I have the short story collection that I mentioned, Who Lost I Found. Um, that's coming out later this year. I don't know exactly when, but I did get an email from the publisher today that they're doing the formatting and the layout. So hopefully it won't be too much longer. Yeah. Um, and I have a young adult book coming out next year as well, which is Southern Gothic Horror. Um, I'm telling all of you on the call, it has not been officially announced yet, but I have signed the contract. Ooh, and, this is exciting. Uh, and, yes, um, even though uh, from an agent point of view, sometimes they tell you to stick to one age group category. Yeah. But, um, I came to writing a little bit later in life than some people did, and I don't want to limit myself. I want to write what I want write to write everything. when I want to write it and write That's everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I have signed the contract for an adult horror novel um, that I don't know exactly when that's coming out. I think either 2024 or early 2025. And again, that one isn't necessarily about grief, but it is about returning home to the family house and what emotions and memories that stirs up and how that can bring you back to a former self that you may not want to face at that time. So, and that'll be a, for adults. So I can actually, write bad words, um, which I always avoid uh, in my middle grade. I just realized I muted myself. That's not, <laughs> you've got a lot going on. Like I am, Eden, you're just writing. I am trying to, like to <laughs> I am trying to play catch up. I'm doing my best. Um, I have a story that I'm still working on the details for the contract, so I can't talk too much about that one, but um, I return to a lot of Gullah Geechee funeral traditions in that particular novella, but that one is for adults. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, we're getting a lot of enthusiastic response in the chat. Some folks don't read horror, but they'll read you if you're writing horror. We've got and, here as well. My horror is not like, you know, <laughs> serial killer chasing you through the woods. It's not any of that kind of horror. It's usually this sort of facing yourself and shadow work and, you know, trying to deal with those aspects of yourself that aren't always what you want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a little bit of magic and mystical because I just like writing that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds perfect. That sounds absolutely perfect. And everyone is ready to empty our bank accounts for it. So <laughs> we have a lot of good stuff to look forward to. Well, thank you so much, Eden, for being here to talk with me about your book. Thank you so much to everyone who was here in the Zoom. Future thanks to everyone who watched this online on YouTube. Hopefully the video actually uploads well enough and we're good to go. And yeah, I'll just um, end the recording here. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs>